All right, everybody. Hello and welcome. As always, I'm Sean, this uneducated gamer playing Football Manager 2015, and today is the very first day of a brand new save that we're going to be doing. I have for a while wanted to do an A-League save, and given that our series with Bromley, our worst first challenge, just finished its first season, I thought rather than going straight into season two, we might mix it up, do a bit of a different save, and it gives me a perfect opportunity to do the A-League save that I've wanted to do for a little while, and it also gives me an opportunity to go my local team here in Australia, which is Melbourne City FC. Now, it's an interesting time to be getting involved with Melbourne City FC. They have recently been purchased by the City Football Group, same group that owns Manchester City and New York City FC in the MLS. And I think they also own a part of Yokohama Marinos in the J League, but I'm not 100% sure on that. The A League itself is a really interesting league in that all the teams fall under a salary cap, which means you can only spend a certain amount of wages per week on your squad. Certain players do fall outside of that, but we'll go through them further. So it's always a super even league, like there isn't that much of a difference between the team that finishes first and the team that finishes 10th. And on any given day, both in the real world and in the game itself, the bottom team can comfortably beat the team on top. So it's a really interesting one in that respect. There are some pretty excellent teams in this league. One of happens to be Melbourne City's crosstown rivals, Melbourne Victory FC. So I think that famous quote by Sir Alex Ferguson regarding Liverpool was that his job was to knock them off their fucking perch. And I'm absolutely going to be trying to do the same thing with Melbourne Victory here in Melbourne. They are an established powerhouse in the league, one of the foundation teams, so one of the first eight sides that were in the competition when it first began in 2005-2006. And you can see here, they've made the finals quite a few times. They've actually won the Champions Trophy three times now, I think. Uh, and this most recent season, the one that we're going to be playing in-game, they were both the league and cup champions. The cup in Australia is known as the Hyundai A-League Final Series. It happens at the end of the year, and the top six sides go into that. Well, the final series is a straight knockout competition where first and second get a week off and I think third plays sixth and fourth plays fifth or something like that. We'll go through that when we get up to it. But they have won the league three times and the final series to be the A-League champions three times as well. So they're the established powerhouse in the league. Both they and Brisbane have won it the most times and I'll be definitely trying to knock them off their perch. Plus the Melbourne Derby is one of the biggest games of the season. Now, Melbourne City itself doesn't have a tremendous amount of history. If we go to the club here, you can see they've finished 10-11 season, 8th, and then 6th, and then 9th, and then this most recent season, they finished 5th. So they've only made the final series twice in their four-year history, so there isn't a tremendous amount of history that came with it. However, prior to being Melbourne City, they were known as Melbourne Heart, came into the A-League as one of the expansion sides, of which there have been quite a few. There were eight teams that first started the league when it began, they've tried to expand several times. Uh, some of them haven't worked out. Teams like Gold Coast United and Far North Queensland Fury have come into the league and then disbanded just because they didn't have the money or they weren't that well run. But the two expansion sides that have come in and done the best are the second teams in the two largest cities. So Melbourne City, the second team in Melbourne with Melbourne Victory and Western Sydney Wanderers, the second team in Sydney. Wellington Phoenix uh, replaced New Zealand Knights. New Zealand Knights was a side that was really poorly run and they hemorrhaged money in their first two seasons in the competition and they weren't really competitive because they didn't spend it at all well. So they folded and Wellington Phoenix was brought forward from that. They moved the team from Auckland to Wellington where they thought there was a bigger base for football. And they've done really well actually, they're a pretty good side. So those are the three sides outside the seven that started in the first season of the league. Some are doing really well off the field. Some have huge fan bases like Victory and Western Sydney. Uh, Sydney operates at a profit. Melbourne City doesn't quite yet. Uh, but there are other teams like Brisbane and Central Coast and Newcastle who are having trouble operating at a profit each year. So they really need to, it's a reason it's probably only 10 teams at the moment. Before they can expand further, they need to see all of the 10 sides operating at a profit margin. But to be honest with you, I think with the introduction of Western Sydney Wanderers, it's kind of made life harder for Newcastle Jets and Central Coast Mariners because they're operating within the same media market. All four of those sides are based within New South Wales. And really, it's just as easy for someone in Newcastle to jump on a train and go down to Sydney and watch a Western Sydney side win than it is to you know, pay up for a full membership at Newcastle United where the team sucks and it's poorly run. And We'll go further through all that before we play these teams, but it's a really interesting league. There's a lot of like subplots and all that sort of thing, and I think my general knowledge of the league itself in the real world will make the videos better each and every week. I did get some good feedback from the Bromley save. You probably could tell if you watched that one that I recorded pretty much that entire series in one day, which was... A long day, but that's how Football Manager works. Before you know it, you've been playing it for 12 hours and you not even realised. This series, though, I'm going to do a little bit differently. I'm going to try and uh, record one episode per day. Hopefully that makes me a little bit brighter, a little bit more entertaining, and the episodes will be a little bit better as a result. 
We like to follow a similar structure though and just do like, you know, key games throughout the course of the season rather than every single one. So when Melbourne Heart was first taken over by the City Football Group, there was initial resistance to the name change and the colour change and all that sort of thing. I didn't quite understand it. I think it's the first time really any sporting side anywhere in Australia in any sporting code has been taken over by an international sporting organisation. I know Brisbane is owned currently by the Bakri Group, which is an Indonesian-based consortium. However, City Football Group kind of came over with the idea that they were going to use it as a development ground. So they did more the facilities and that sort of thing before they looked at the players. And that's reflected in the facilities here. Oh, no, it's not reflected in the game yet, but in Football Manager 2016, it will be. By opening the City Football Academy, I think they've spent about $3 million on this state-of-the-art coaching centre in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. It's virtually identical to the ones used by New York City FC and Manchester City FC, so it'll be the first time in Australia, so I should have five-star training facilities, and I guess five-star youth facilities, I think it's all part of the same bit. But for the moment, they're just still out at Broadmeadows and Latrobe Uni playing fields, and it'll remain that way until the release of the new game, I guess. We are playing in an updated database, so it is their current squads, so it includes the most recent off-season and the most recent European transfer window but we'll go through the teams a little bit later. Given that this is an Australian dynasty save as well, I am gonna play with a significant handicap in that I'm not gonna use any international players, I'm just gonna use Australian players. So I'm gonna try and put together the best squad I can from an entirely Australian lineup. Let's go and introduce ourselves to Brian Marwood. You can see here, uneducated gamer hired as Melbourne City manager, which is great for me. Personal message from Brian Marwood, who is the chairman at Melbourne City, and he also has a similar role on the board of Manchester City as well. I'll attend the meeting with him and let's get this meeting started. I want to achieve big things and I definitely have the ability to do that at Melbourne City. Young club, I'm still going to get him to send the history through even though there isn't that much to talk about. I don't want to be judged on any philosophies. I'll do a pre-match, uh, sorry, a press conference to announce myself as the new manager of Melbourne City. And I won't set up a meeting with Ivan Yolich, I'll do all that off screen. Now you can see here some of the A-League contract and registration rules that I went through earlier. So every team operates within a salary cap. Basically, if there was any league in the world that I could compare it to, it's most likely the MLS. They also operate within a salary cap so that the clubs are all underwritten by the league itself and they're all operating within their means. There are players that you can get outside of that. So you can see here, players on marquee contracts are exempt from the salary cap means you can have one player in your squad that you can offer stupid amounts of money to. As long as his reputation is high enough in world football that he deserves a marquee contract, the board will let you do that. So there are a few really handy marquees across the league. And you can also have an Australian marquee. That one was really designed to help bring back like the golden generation of Australian players. Those that played at the 2006 and maybe just finished their careers at the 2010 World Cup. Guys like Harry Kuehl, Mark Viduka, Jason Kalina, those are a few that those uh, contracts were designed for. Given that squad has kind of dried up and it's harder and harder to bring young European players back to the A-League, it's now that you can sign any two players to marquee contracts, whether they are internationals or Australian players. You can also have three junior marquee contracts, which is for basically for anyone under 23 who holds Australian citizenship. And you can also sign guest players, not that I've ever done it, most famous guest player that's ever played was for Melbourne City at the start of last year. It was David Villa before he went to New York City in the gap between the European season finishing with Atletico Madrid and New York starting the following March. He came to Melbourne. He only played four games. He didn't play the 10 that we were maybe hoping he would, but he was still magnificent during that time and absolutely helped City sell a lot more memberships than they were expected to. And to be honest, the team wasn't that great when he was there and he still dragged us to like I think he got two goals that saved two draws for us. Yeah, dude's an absolute star. So he's probably the biggest and best player to play in the league so far. So for the moment, we won't be having an international marquee. We'll just have an Australian one. And I think we can have marquee as an Australian player, but we'll deal with that later. New subscriptions, I'm just going to skip through. Through the magic of editing, though, you won't have to see it. And you can see here the history that Brian Marwood has sent through to us. There isn't a tremendous amount here. So no honours won. Any trophies I can bring to the club across this series will be the first ones that have come to the club. And as I was saying earlier, there were fans that were really upset that like the team wanted to leave the red and white colour scheme that we used, which is that red and white stripes that you see here, the away, which they've kept on as the away kit. That was the initial home kit for the first few years. But again, we have no history in it. We never really won anything in it. Melbourne victory during this three-year period was probably at their best, including this last season. So I wasn't necessarily against them changing the colours or the name or anything like that. They've still incorporated a ton of heart stuff in there. These little sticker things that you can't see here, they're... Um, the outline of the initial Melbourne Heart logo, which unfortunately I don't have anywhere in the game, but I'm sure I can find it somewhere and put it up at a later date. 
And they've kept the red and white stripes as an away kit. So I think they're kind of trying to placate out those fans. But really, anything we win at this point will be the most successful we've been. And it'll be because of the City Football Group investment. So they can fucking make us whatever colour they want, as far as I'm concerned. One grading thing was, though, I'm a United fan. And the club is now so closely affiliated with Manchester City. That stings a little bit. But it's the best thing for Australian football that really could have happened, and it's the best thing for the club that could have happened in a million years. As I mentioned earlier, the City Footballing Academy will be a part of the next version of the game, and hopefully that means five-star training facilities and youth facilities. But for the moment, we're still at the three-star youth facilities, the La Trobe University Lowell Playing Fields, and Broadmeadows Valley Park as our one-star training facilities. So it might be something that we keep an eye on, getting the owners to invest more in the training facilities. And to introduce myself to the players now, I'm just gonna stick with assertive for these answers. I want to take the opportunity to introduce myself. Uh, I think we can finish in a respectable position. I think we can win it, but that's fine. I have to put the squad together. Assertively, I disagree. Everyone just needs to perform. And that's exactly the reaction I'm after. Okay, so Pardalou and Grucho haven't responded well, but everyone else seems pretty cool with it. Let's have a look at the tactic that we're gonna use for this one now. Melbourne Heart, since its inception, has had a really Dutch influence. That is largely because of John Van Schip, or Schip, or however you want to pronounce that. He is an ex-Dutch international, an ex-Ajax player, and if we go through his history here, you can see he was the initial manager of Melbourne Heart when they were first founded in 2009, first season being 2010-2011. So he's an incredibly talented manager. He really did quite well with an aging side that was kind of put together before he really got there. And then when Melbourne Heart was having rough periods, he really brought through a lot of good young players that have either gone on to other clubs overseas or they're at other clubs in Asia, other clubs in the league now. So I thought he did a really tremendous job and never was really given the opportunity or the money or the backing financially to go out and create a title winning side. But he still dragged the side to their one finals appearance prior to the purchase of Melbourne Heart. Then he went over and was the manager of Shivas in Mexico. His family actually stayed in Melbourne. They settled around the area and his son Davey played for a couple of teams locally around the place here. Then he went to Shivas, had a terrible time. I think he got sacked after about four months. So that didn't really work out for him. I don't even think he had time to learn Spanish during that period. Came back as the head of youth development for Melbourne Heart. They were then being managed by John Aloisi, who was an absolute joke. I've never seen any coach have less of an idea about a team. They actually went on a game, 16 games in a row without winning, which is an A-league record and won't be beaten for a very long time, given it's only a 27 game season. I'm amazed he was given the time that he was, considering how poor the team was playing. And the worst part was that he gave all these like three, two and three year contracts to players that weren't up to the level. Some of those guys are still at the club. We'll go through them shortly. But the best thing that could ever happen was when they sacked him and John Vanch Gip came as the caretaker manager. And last season, despite it still being under the City Football Group, he was still dealing with a lot of the contracts that John Aloisi had handed out. You can't just terminate contracts in Australia because they're all part of the players' union and they'll go on strike or whatever. As we've seen with some other teams throughout the course of this year, but we'll talk about that further later. So he's now really this season getting his first opportunity to create his own squad and has big financial backing and the team's looked pretty good so far in pre-season and everything and they've brought back some really talented players, both Australian and internationals as well, but we'll go through them further. Because of his influence and because of the Dutch influence we've seen on the Melbourne City side, there have always been Dutch players playing. Uh, guys like Orlando Engelaar, who was our most recent marquee, Gerald Saibon in Melbourne Hearts in the initial season, and then bit part of a busy players like Rick Verm, uh, Marcel Mewis, Robbie Viola was the most recent one. All guys that have come from the Arata Vizzi to play for Melbourne Heart and done a pretty good job. They're good technical players. Problem is, with guys like that, you bring them over really late in their career, so they're the wrong side of 30 when they come to play in a very physical league. But in his honor, we're going to continue with the 4-3-3, and I've created the uneducated 4-3-3 here. We'll go through it further now. Some of the roles are a little bit different to what I've done before, and it's a different shape and setup to our Bromley save where we played that 4-4-2 or 4-2-3-1. I can't even remember what we did, to be honest. So it's an attacking mentality with a fluid team shape. We have 16 instructions. I don't really like to do more than 15, so I've gone over it just one time. They are retain possession, shorter passing, pass into space, work the ball into the box, play out of defense, whip crosses, run at defense, exploit flanks, look for overlap, play wider, drop deeper, stick to positions, close down more, stay on feet, higher tempo with more expressive play there. That's because we are playing a 4-3-3. A lot of the creativity will come from the wing positions, and we're blessed to have two pretty awesome fullbacks at both left and right fullback. So really those wide spots should be positions where we should be able to make up for having maybe a man disadvantage in these little pockets here, just by way of sheer quality in those positions. And I think that's reflected in the instructions, playing wide, looking for overlaps, getting the ball down and whipping crosses in behind to an advanced forward is probably our best option. We don't have a big massive target man. 
and when we play with the target man, I feel like he drops way too deep to be involved in like the final ball in. Idea being, playing an advanced forward, they'll fly into the box and be pushing up high on a defensive line, looking for those whip balls in behind, and then the other winger on the opposite side will be looking for a back stick run. It's the idea, probably won't work out that way, but that's what we're going with. So I've got individual instructions to each of these players as well. For those of you that have watched my previous saves, you know I don't like to do more than four, and I haven't in this series. So goalkeepers just set to the defender instruction. They're gonna to distribute to fullbacks, take short kicks, and distribute quickly, which falls in line with us wanting to play the ball out from the back and for our shorter passing game that we're gonna play. They're just gonna to look to distribute the fullbacks and they will take the ball from there. They'll be our main outlet transitioning from defense into midfield and then into attack as well. So their instructions are the same on both sides and they are dribble more, fewer risky passes, stay wider and run wide with the ball. I don't mind if they dribble a bit in these areas, there isn't a lot of pressure being put on that particular position. However, I don't want them knocking in super deep balls or anything. I just want them playing simple short passes back into the midfield and then maybe pulling out overlapping runs themselves as wingers cut in and that sort of thing. But we'll see if that happens or if it's just a dream that I've got here. So we're going to play with two central defenders. Basically, their responsibility will be to stay back at all times and hold this line relatively deep. Don't want to get caught out with balls over the top. I don't really mind balls getting punted into the corner as long as the central defenders are dropping. So they're going to stay back at all times. They are going to close down less. I'll go through why that is in a minute. Tackle harder, mark tighter, and pass it shorter. Players at this level are good enough to pass it out, so they should be able to either distribute to the fullbacks or play a ball forward into the midfield without too much dramas. Don't necessarily need them hoofing the ball long and over the top. We have enough quality to play it out from the back. The reason they're not going to close down is because I just want them dropping as much as possible and seeing in front of them for the first time, I've never actually used this one before, is a midfield anchor man. Their role won't be particularly a man marking one. They are just going to close down the ball and make sure that the centre backs don't have to jump into tackles in midfield or high areas. So he's going to be the one pressing the ball along this area here. And his other instructions are to tackle harder, mark tighter, and pass it shorter. He's just going to distribute it to the other midfield players, not necessarily looking for long balls over the top or anything like that, unless it's under pressure and has to clear it, and then I don't really care. In midfield, we're going to play with two advanced playmakers ahead of him. I've actually never tried this before, playing with two advanced playmakers. I think it might be okay, and I think there are some pretty handy players that we can get to fill in those roles. However, I do want them to have defensive responsibilities, so they are set to close down more, tackle harder, and mark tighter but they have permission to play a few more direct passes. Don't mind if they look for an angle ball in behind for a winger to chase, or if they try and pick out a fullback on an overlap or something like that. So they've got a bit more license to be a little bit more direct in their passing, though I'm hoping that doesn't mean they just pump balls at the advanced forward to chase down or anything like that. And we'll have to keep an eye on how playing two advanced forwards next to each other goes in the game. I think it should be okay, but we'll see what happens. Wingers will be the creative hub of the side. They already have a ton of instructions when they're set to winger and the attack function. So I've just set them to shoot less often, more direct passes and cross aim center. That's because I want them whipping balls in behind the defense into these middle areas to make it difficult for the back line to deal with. Shoot less often is because I don't want them cutting in and striking a ball, which they have a nasty tendency to do. And their instructions are the same on both sides and they can look for more direct passes as well. If it's on, they can play it. Though ideally I would like them to get to the byline and knock balls back across. But I'm sure being set to attack, they'll do that anyway. Up front, leading the line, we're going to go with an advance forward, as I mentioned earlier. Their instructions are shoot more often, more direct, more risky, and hold up ball. That's just so once the ball gets them in the 18-yard box, they can have a shot. I don't really care outside of that. They're just really there as a finisher, and we'll try and pick someone up with a good finishing stat. So that as soon as the ball hits the deck in the box, he's the first one to it, and just getting his strike away as soon as possible. More direct and more risky means that if he's holding the ball up in these areas, I don't mind if he knocks one in behind in the corner for a winger to run onto. So he has permission there, and hold up the ball is just to give everyone an opportunity to push forward. Ideally, um, this three here, the two central defenders and the anchor man will always be sitting back. The advanced playmakers aren't set to attack, just to support. So they'll be sitting around these top areas at the top of the box. We'll have the wingers pushing on and then the fullbacks, of course, looking for overlapping runs as well. So we're committing quite a few forward in the final third. And if he can just hold it up sometimes to bring those players into play, that would be awesome. So that's the shape and the formation and the tactics that we're gonna use throughout the course of the season. I will stick with it mainly because I'm brutally stubborn. And I think it can be more than successful in this league, and we can continue a bit of the Melbourne Heart tradition by playing that very Dutch 4-3-3 system. We will have to bring some players in for it, though we do have some pretty excellent players at the club already. Before we look at all of them, though, let's have a look at the players that we're going to get rid of. So usually in an A-League side, you're allowed to have five international players in your squad. They are currently Thomas Sorensen, Harry Navio, Aaron Hughes, Robert Corrin, and Bruno Fornaroli. You might recognize a few of those names. Thomas Sorensen is an ex-Aston Villa and Stoke goalkeeper and played at Sunderland early in his career. I've clearly forgotten about that. So hundreds of appearances 
in the Premier League itself. Really good goalkeeper. Now, given that this is an updated database, he actually wasn't at the club last year for the regular season. And because of that, it looks like he's left Stoke a year early. We're using that pro updated database. I think that's how you pronounce it. It's PR and then the number zero if you want to go and check it out yourself. But it means that all these squads here have updated rosters and everything as well, which is great. So unfortunately, Tosh Sorensen will be leaving. Harry Navio is an ex-Leon youth team player, a pretty awesome winger for this level. If he is not an absolute beast in the next uh, in Football Manager 2016, there's no justice in the world. He's strong, he's quick, he's got a cannon of a shot on him. He's only 23, and he seems to really love Melbourne as a city. He is an absolute beast and thankfully signed himself a two-year deal recently, I think. So I'll be sad to see him go, but that's the nature of our Australian dynasty save. Aaron Hughes, ex-Newcastle and Fulham and QPR defender, and Aston Villa as well in there for a little bit, it looks like. Uh, still actually part of the Northern Ireland national team, is helping them qualify for the Euros at the moment. 90 caps. One goal, 34 years of age. Despite that, he's probably going to be a pretty awesome central defender in the real world within the A-League itself. And if he was playing and holding that deep defensive line for us, I think he'd be great. However, we're getting rid of him. Robbie Corrin is the current marquee player for Melbourne City. You can tell by the wage he's getting here. 29k per week is like six times more than the nearest person will be getting to him. And despite them spending that tremendous amount of money on him last year, he hasn't really performed that well on the pitch just yet. Some people could say he's been played out of position by the form of other players that we have in the squad. Sometimes he's played on a wing, sometimes he's played up front as like a false nine. He wants to play in the midfield, but really, I don't think he has the legs to do it anymore. Really good technically player, but the A-League is a super physical league, so you've got to kind of be running all day in the middle of the park there, and you can't really carry anyone despite playing three in midfield the way we do. It remains to be seen. He's in the second year of his marquee contract this year in the real world. It kind of remains to be seen exactly how he's going to do. Hopefully it's a bit better. Uh, I think he has the ability to do really good things in the league, but if he doesn't, you can see that marquee contract's gonna disappear for him relatively quickly. And he'll be 34 or 35 in the real world come the beginning of the new season. Bruno Fornaroli or El Tuna or the Prickly Pear, as he is known, is a Uruguayan striker. I don't know a lot about this guy, I'm yet to see him play, but doesn't seem to have a whole lot of physical attributes about him. Mantles are okay, technical ability is good. Played at a few different clubs around Europe, with Nasty and Ireland, Uruguay first, then at Sampdoria, uh, Recreativo, Panathinaikos. So he's been about the place and now making home in Melbourne City. Hopefully he can be good for us in the league, but we'll have to wait and see. So those guys will be leaving the club, sadly. Well, not really sadly, because I don't care. So we're just going to set them to not needed. We're going to set their loan status to unavailable for loan. I'm going to transfer list all of them, and I am going to add them to the unwanted list to sell or release. And basically, John Didaluka, our current director of football, it's now his responsibility to sell or release these players. We should be able to get profit for at least one of them, maybe. But honestly, I, the likelihood is all their contracts will just be mutually terminated later on in the preseason. But I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to put them in the reserves, and then it's not on me when we hemorrhage that money through letting them all go. That does mean we'll have to bring certain players in. There are a couple of players here that we're going to get rid of as well. There's a couple in the youth that we'll probably promote. However, if you remember back to the Bromley save, I find my transfer targets the exact same way every time. If we go to our tactics here and click on an individual role, it actually tells you the important attributes for that particular role and position. So goalkeeper defender is an example. Um, you can see here exactly what it needs in a player. Your assistant may tell you you've got a five-star player or you've got a player that has the potential to play in Premier League or something like that, which is great. But if he doesn't fill the important attributes of the role that you're playing him in, then he's not gonna be any good for you, so it's pointless. So I really just go on this, and I give a run a score. So like, for example, one, two, three, 12, 13. So if someone will get a score out of 13, let's say it would be seven or eight out of 13, and that means that they have seven or eight of the key attributes that we're looking for. Now to identify transfer targets, I have gone and turned these into filters. If we have a look here, you can see goalkeeper defend, and it's all of those key attributes that we're looking for here. And we want them to be at least 10 for the keeper that we're looking at. You can see here it's brought up with two. Uh, Kanan Hasajic, a Bosnian and Rubinho, a Brazilian goalkeeper who's at Juve, who's currently transfer listed. As extra ones here, we would probably say contract status is expired. There's no need to pay for players when you can get them for free. And we'd also say that their nationality is Australian. And then we just work our way back. We'd go to like 10 out of 13. You can see here, Matt Acton, Nathan Coe, two keepers that we could look at bringing in. However, I'm gonna identify transfer targets off screen so you won't have to notice them too much. And I'm gonna get rid of the other few players at the club that we're not really gonna be looking to retain or anything like that. Again, through the magic of editing, you won't have to watch it and I'll see you again in a second. Ta-da! So here are the five transfer targets we'd go for. 
Ryan Edwards, who is an attacking right winger. He's only 20. He has played in the A-League before with Perth Glory. Interestingly enough, when he was at Perth Glory, he was managed by his dad, Alistair Edwards. And his dad, well, he got sacked for a bunch of reasons, but one of them was nepotism because he kept playing Ryan and his other brother, Cameron Edwards, ahead of more established Perth Glory players. Certainly better Perth Glory players. So I think some of the older members of the team went to him and said, like, why are you playing your kids ahead of players who are more deserving? Perth had a really rough year that year, so I think it kind of contributed to their poor form and their team not necessarily getting along. He ended up getting sacked which definitely could have been for their performance and all that sort of thing. But a big part of that was him playing his kids. So he does know the league a little bit. 15 appearances, zero goals, despite only being like 19 years old. Been a part of the Reading Academy, so he'd be a great one to return to Australia and play for Melbourne City here. Chris Hurd's another one, ex-Aston Villa Academy player. Actually broke into their first team for a little bit, but has just had horrendous luck with injuries over the course of his career. Can play at centre-back, can play in the middle. We'd probably be looking for him to play centre of the park there. James Holland is an ex-Austria Vienne player, played at AZ Alkmaar. Started his career with Newcastle Jets in their title-winning season in 2007-2008. Uh, pretty solid holding midfielder. I don't know if we'll get him. I think he's going to want more money than we can offer because his reputation is actually pretty high. Um, and there are other European teams looking to sign him as well. But he'd be awesome for us if we can get him despite only being 25. So it'll kind of be one, one of him or Heard will come in for that center of the park spot. We need to add a defender. So Shane Lowry will be that. He's a left-footed defender, which I always love. So he can play at left fullback and in the center. We'd be looking for him to be a left side of central defender. We'll go through who his partner would be further in a moment. Good physical attributes here. Uh, pretty awesome mental attributes. Good technical ability for a center back. You don't need much more than like heading, marking passing tackling he's not going to be getting forward to cross or shoot or anything like that so more than happy with him and Dario Vitasic Dario Vitasic I'm not 100% sure what I'm going to do with he might play like on the left or the right wing he might play as a striker he's not going to play in the hole because we're not really using anyone in the hole in this formation however he's really good technically he has played in the league before a couple of times for both Brisbane Raw and uh, Adelaide United other side of a stint in Germany First for Nuremberg, then for Bellafield on loan. He came back to Adelaide and he was pretty good in those two seasons. Played in a midfield role, managed to chip in with five goals in the first season and 10 in the second. Got himself a big money move back to Sion in the Swiss League, who at the time were managed by Genero Gattuso, the ex-AC Milan midfielder. They ran into a bit of financial trouble and his contract ended up getting terminated, which is why he's sitting as a free agent now. But he still did well. 29 appearances, six goals from for a midfield player. That's pretty good. We might look to push him a little bit further and play him as an advance forward or on one of the wings. I'm not really sure, but for the moment, I've just offered all five of these players trials just to bring them in so they can see what the club is like. I have a running theory, but I'm yet to prove it, that if you bring someone to a club on trial and they enjoy it and they enjoy the training, they lower their wage demands a bit. Like if I was going to try and sign one of these guys now, they've been at a European club, so they're probably going to all want marquee contracts. Whereas if I try and bring them in a week once they've been training with us for a little bit and see our facilities and see our team, I feel like that might be able to knock their wages down a little bit. I've actually done that with all of the squad that we've got here. Uh, I've offered them all new contracts at lower money than what they're being paid now. The way that you do that is through use of um, appearance fees, goal bonuses, clean sheet bonuses, um, signing on fees for signing new contracts, and try and knock them down just so that we can get as low under that $49,000 a week that we're spending. I've also taken a massive, massive gamble here with two of the players. Aaron Moy and David Williams. They're both two really good players. David Williams is the current Australian marquee. However, they're both on stupid money. Aaron Moy's on 5.75K a week. He has actually in the real world signed on as a marquee player for the next season uh, with Melbourne City. Really good player, absolute beast last year. Dragged a very poor Melbourne City team at times into the final series. Led the side in goals, assists, chances created, tackles per game, dribbles per game, uh, crosses, and shots on target. Despite all of that, for a midfield player, he didn't win the league best and fairest, which he absolutely should have done. For whatever reason, they tend to take goals into it too much. I think dragging a pretty average side into a final series is more than worthy of that award. But he didn't get it. But he has been rewarded with that marquee deal. And he's probably on a bit too much money. So I'm going to release him. And I'm actually going to try and sign him back again. Because I think I can get him back on new money. He won't negotiate a new contract right now. Because why would he? Why would he take less when he's got a club? So... I'm going to release him from his contract and then offer him a trial and then try and sign him again. And we're going to do the exact same thing with David Williams as well. David Williams is fairly rubbish, if I'm being brutally honest. It says here he's a striker. He's not. He's a winger. 
that's just because of the season before last he played up front because no one else could. He's just pace and not a whole lot else. So you can see here, pace, stamina, acceleration, agility, all really good. Mental attributes are nothing to really look at there. And he can't finish, he can't really head, so he's not great for that advanced forward role. However, he can dribble and cross a bit, so we'd be looking to play him as a winger. However, not a winger worth 6.75k a week. So we're going to release him as well from his two-year contract. It'll mean we take a little bit of a hit financially, but we have quite a bit in our transfer budget, so that's fine. And I'll try and offer him a trial and then try and assign him to a lower contract, something around like maybe three or four K a week instead, just to bring our wage budget down and under control. So it's a risk I'm going to take. It's not something I've tried doing before with the two of them. I have a feeling it might work and it might be one of those like glitchy loophole things, but I'm absolutely going to do it. So that's those two. Might as well drop them down into the youth squad until they get released in their contracts. Let's introduce you to the rest of the squad now. In goal, we're going to go with Tando Vlafi. For whatever reason, he is just criminally underrated in this game and has been for quite some time. I just career at Perth Glory, then was at Melbourne Victory for a bit before crossing over to Melbourne Heart. Really good keeper. If you asked any Melbourne City fan, you'd say he's probably the best keeper when given the opportunities that we've had in a long time. However, he just doesn't seem to get many of those chances. I have offered him a short, a longer term deal up until 2019 for only a K a week. So he'd be on next to no money. He'd be contributing bugger all to our wage budget each week. More than capable of filling in as a first choice goalkeeper. So we're going to give him the opportunity to prove himself in this game. But again, like I said, only 74K a week value. He's just never rated that highly in this game for whatever reason. Maybe the FM scouts don't see him playing his best games or whatever, but We'll give him an opportunity to be first choice for this season. And I brought up Marco Stavania from the youth team. Just because for a backup goalkeeper, you don't really need anything that great. And he's on bugger all money a week, so it'll be perfect for our wage budget. So he's going to get the promotion there, though he's unlikely to challenge for Lafayette for the majority of the time. At fullback, we're lucky to have very strong players in those positions. First at left back, Michael Zullo, who is an ex-Australian international. 10 appearances, you can see here. Left footed player on the left hand side. I absolutely love when that is the case making a return to Australian football after spending the last few years at Utrecht in the Eredivisie. Started his career at Queensland Raw, which then became Brisbane Raw. He was awesome in that period. They played him mostly as a left winger. Went over to Utrecht and they converted him to be sort of a left wing back, and that's the role he's fulfilled for the national side as well. Came back on loan at Adelaide United the season before last and was pretty good in those appearances. Played at left back in a pretty solid side that I think finished third at the time. He went back to Utrecht and unfortunately did his ACL before his contract finished and now he's returned to Melbourne City with an opportunity to sort of regain his footing again, maybe with both the national team and in his club career. He was only on a one-year deal. However, I have offered him a new contract as well, hopefully to get him down to about 3K a week, though he's more than worth it. Really, really good left fullback to have and is still only 25, so that his best years are probably still ahead of him. Thrilled to have him. His backup will be Jack Clisby, who's a player we signed mid-season from Perth Glory. You can see he's wearing the Perth Glory kit there. Still only 22, solid left-footed player as well. Pretty solid physicals, um, good technical ability for the left-back role, and mentals aren't bad as well. He'll be purely a backup, but he's on, again, next to no money on a relatively short-term deal. So happy to have him in there as well. On the right-hand side, we have another Australian international, even Franich. 10 appearances as well. Despite being 26 years old, he's a bit older. He was part of the all-conquering Brisbane Raw side that won three titles in four years. And he got himself a big money move to Torpedo Moscow in Russia. You can't see that here because it's been replaced by Melbourne City, obviously. Had issues at Melbourne, uh, sorry, had issues in Moscow with both not playing and not getting paid. He ended up taking them to court to like some European sports tribunal and ended up getting his contract terminated. So he returns after an unhappy period in Europe despite finally getting his big chance. He's a Melbourne boy, so it's good to see him playing for one of the Melbourne sides. Super, super reliable right back and probably the first choice right back for the national team when he's fit and available. Good technical attributes, mental attributes perfectly fine and physically he's an absolute beast. He'll run up and down this line all day long if we need him to. His backup will be Paolo Retro, who is an attacking midfielder, but most of his opportunities in both the real world and in this game have been at right fullback. So I'm gonna continue that development. We're gonna have him working on that position throughout the course of preseason. You can see here, pretty good technical ability. Um, probably better suited to playing out in wide areas more than anything super defensive, but mentally all right, physically is all right as well. Still only 21, so young, not on a lot of money either. I have offered him a long-term deal as well. Hopefully he'll sign that and that means it'll bring his wage down a little bit, but more than capable of fulfilling in at the right fullback spot. So we're gonna get him training on that position now. We have two central defenders now, plus hopefully Shane Lowry, who we spoke about earlier. Connor Chapman will likely get the nod as Shane Lowry's partner in the middle if we get him. Only 19 years old, but already an absolute beast. You can see physically double figures for everything. 
Mental stats are pretty solid as well. His aggression's probably way higher than this. He's prone to an occasional red card every now and then. But uh, otherwise, absolutely fine in the game. And has everything that we're looking for here. First touch, heading, marking, passing, tackling, and technique. All double figures. Don't really care about any of the rest of it. I don't need him taking throws or anything like that. So I think being 19 and playing the majority of the games this season, he will likely improve even further. And our third choice, probably first choice in the real world, but third choice in the game will be Paddy Kisnorbo. Any Leicester or Leeds fans will probably recognise him immediately. He has captained both sides earlier in his career. Played at South Melbourne in the old National Soccer League, which was replaced by the A-League in 2006. Got a free transfer to Hearts in the Scottish Premiership before playing for Leicester for four years, and four years at Leeds before playing for Ipswich and returning to Melbourne Heart. Really tough as nails, gritty defender. If there's a ball coming in, he'll put his face, his crutch, his neck, his toes, whatever it is, in the way of it. Wouldn't be an Australian appearance if he didn't end up bleeding from the head. You can see that here from his 18 appearances and one goal. Despite being 33, he's more than solid enough to keep playing at an A-League level. However, in-game, as soon as someone hits 32, you know that their stats are just going to decrease entirely. So I've offered him a long-term deal. One to 2019, which I know is risky for a 33-year-old, but it's a calculated risk I'm taking. That way, we can drop his wage down to 3K a week on a long-term deal, and I'm going to back him to retire within the next two years or so. I don't think in-game he'd continue beyond 35. So we'll offer him that long-term deal to get his wage down. Even though he will still be amongst the highest paid players at the club, even on 3K a week, I'm going to take that gamble and assume that he's not going to see out his contract and will retire before then. But uh, he's more than solid enough to be a backup central defender for us there. It's just his physical attributes that are going to deteriorate being a little bit older. So he's fine to jump in for other games. Holding midfield, we have Eric Pardalou, who's an absolute beast. A part of that same side with Ivan Franich, that Brisbane Raw side that won three titles in four years. He's a unit, big physical lad, 193 centimetres tall, 87 kilos, strong as Knox. He will run all day for you as well. We're going to train him into that anchorman role. I think he's one of the best defensive midfielders Australia's ever produced, bar nobody. And we're very lucky to have him at the club. So played in that treble-winning Brisbane Raw side and then got himself a big money move to Tianjin in the Chinese Super League. Got himself a good pay packet for a year, then a good pay packet at Muntong United in the Thai Premier League. Probably not pronouncing that at all right before returning to Melbourne City this season just gone. And he was an absolute unit. Does the defensive duties of various players in that midfield. I think he's a fantastic player and we're lucky to have him. Still only 28, so probably got a couple of good years left in him in this save before he starts to deteriorate. Offered him a long-term deal as well. Try to get him down to about 4K. We'll see how that goes. His understudy will be Jacob Melling, who is a little nugget and just a bundle of energy in the middle of the park. Broke into the first team in the real world this most recent season, and he's super fit. Just runs all day. Super annoying player. Really played well with Eric Pardalou holding midfield so that he could just like buzz around into space and all that sort of thing. And our best performances throughout the course of the season. It's not a coincidence that he was part of them. So he's still only 19. He's on next to no money. I've offered him a long-term deal for less money a week. More than happy to give him opportunities in both the advanced playmaker role here and as the understudy for that anchorman role. And given 12 months of development as a teenager, I think he's going to skyrocket very quickly. You see here, a lot of his technical abilities that aren't double figures are eights and nines. So give it 12 months, they'll likely be double figures and just already a beast physically and pretty good mental attributes as well. Though aggression is one that we'll have to keep an eye on for yellow cards and that sort of thing. In the center of the park, we spoke about Aaron Moy earlier. I'd like to get him back as soon as possible. Understudy to him would be Stefan Mork, another 18-year-old teenager. Has played a bunch of times for the under-20 and under-19 sides. Pretty good physical attributes for someone so young. Not the strongest in the world, but already suited to that advanced playmaker role. Good mental attributes and technical ability will hopefully come with exposure to the first team. Again, he's on bugger all money, so I've offered him a long-term deal. He'll happily sign that because he's been at the club since his career started. First with Melbourne Heart, previously at the AIS before that. So he'll be the backup there. Ideally, we'd get Aaron Moy and either Chris Hurd or James Holland as those advanced playmakers, but we'll have to wait and see how the preseason goes there. On the left wing for the moment, we only have Ben Garuccio. It remains to be seen whether we bring in Vitasic or Williams for that starting left wing spot, but another talented teenager on bugger all money, only 19 years old. John Aloisi, in his infinite fucking wisdom, decided he was going to turn him into a left wing back because that's apparently something we do. He's not. He's just a really solid winger. Good pace over five yards, good acceleration, solid agility. Crossing and dribbling um, are both fantastic and a really good work rate, really good flair. So he'll be more than capable of filling in at that left wing spot when we need him to. And it could be a breakout year for him. He could get an extended run inside if he performs well. I do love having left-footed players on the left-hand side, which he has won. 
Hernan Espindola promoted from the youth team. He's likely going to be a backup on the right-hand side. Probably give Ryan Edwards the opportunity if he signs, or Vitisic if he signs, or Williams if we get him back on a cheaper deal. But you can see here, decent enough pace acceleration. Good crossing, um, dribbling, and a couple other things in nines as well. So exposure to the first team this year as a 19-year-old. Should hopefully see some of those head into double figures. If not, his contract's up at the end of the year, so we can get rid of him, and he's on bugger all money anyway. Have offered both of these guys permanent deals, though. They're currently on youth team contracts. So I've offered them both full-time deals just to kind of include them in the wage budget and whatever, and we'll go from there. Up front, starting in our advanced forward role will be Corey Gamero. Started his career at Fulham in their academy. Went on loan to Hazen Yetting, FC Eindhoven, and Wellington Phoenix during that time. Once his Fulham contract ended, he came back and played for Sydney FC in the league. Actually spent two seasons there, but you of course can't see it in this edited database. 15 appearances, two goals in his first season. Most recently, he actually did his ACL. So he missed the majority of Sydney FC's most recent campaign in the real world, which is unfortunate because he's a good player. Super quick, off the line, great pace, great acceleration, finishing and heading, which is exactly what we want from that advanced forward. Already pretty comfortable in the role. We're going to have him and everyone else working on their roles during the preseason. Glad to get him. Still in the 21, so I think there's still improvements to be made all across the board here. Worst case scenario, we play someone like Vitasic up front ahead of him, and he becomes a pretty awesome backup to have. Still on bugger all money. I've offered him a long-term deal as well to drop that down to about 2K. More than happy to spend that on him. Mark Marino, another teenager that we're going to give an opportunity as a backup there as well. Already can play advanced forward bit. You can see most of his physical attributes are regarding fitness, acceleration, and pace. Mental attributes are okay. Technically, he needs to improve a bit, but you can see here, Finishing first touch, heading and long shots are the ones he has double figures, and that's all we really need from advanced forward. So another one, only a teenager, one of about five or six teenagers in the squad. Uh, probably the most backup player that we have. He and Espindola probably shouldn't expect, and Stavania, probably shouldn't expect to make a lot of appearances this year, but they're only set to being like youth hot, hot prospects and whatever. So absolutely fine to give them the opportunity to fill out our squad. Ideally, we'd bring in the four players that we announced earlier. Oh, well, hang on. It's going to be six, isn't it? So we've got five that we're going after as transfer targets. Ideally, we'll bring in four of them, plus the two that we released in Williams and Moy, and it'll give us a perfect squad of 20. You can have 23 players in the A-League. However, I don't think we really need them. I think 20 is more than enough when you're only playing like a game every week for the majority of the season. I'm not going to make anyone sit through the preseason with me. I'm going to do that off screen or through the power of editing. I will just fast forward to that. However, we have two competitive fixtures in that time. First gun is our FFA Cup first round game. Stands for Football Federation Australia Cup. It's the Australian version of the FA Cup. So the majority of our early games will be teams in lower leagues. Teams playing around state leagues in New South Wales or Victoria, which is the state uh, Melbourne is in. And basically for the other Tuesday, so those games are every Tuesday. And then for the rest of preseason, I'm going to play a game every Tuesday against a local side here. Lucky enough to have a really talented Victorian Premier League around Melbourne. Some of these teams are really good. Some of them are actually exit National Soccer League teams. So we're just going to play one of those teams every Tuesday. And of course, we should have another FFA Cup round game somewhere in here, which I'm sure will cancel a friendly at some point. But that's all I'm going to do. We're playing all our games at home, so it'll give us the extra revenue that comes with playing matches during the course of the year. And it'll keep us fit and give us a week between our FFA Cup games and then a full 10 days off before the season begins against Sydney FC. Again, through the power of editing, I'm not going to make you watch that. I'm going to go off screen, try and bring in our transfer targets. Hopefully they'll agree to the trial periods that we've offered here. Try and bring Aaron Moy and David Williams back to the club as well and also play through our preseason. So I'll see you again here for the first game of the season against Sydney FC. It won't be a part of this episode, but we can recap the entire preseason when we get to that. Oh, just one more thing before we go. Our training will just be everyone working on their individual roles within the squad. I've set it to heavy, but I might push that back to average. We'll see how they respond to it. But that's just everyone working on their individual roles within the team. And once we get those guys in on trial and on transfers, we'll have them doing the exact same as well. So that'll be it for the duration of the preseason. And I will see you again in a moment. And ta-da! Just like that, we have flown through the entirety of the preseason. Where is the best place to start here? Okay, let's go with the staff. I've offered all of our staff uh, full-time contracts, so they're all on maximum deals now till 2019. Just on the regular pay that they were on, that's just to cut down the running costs of the club, so they've all taken a little bit of a pay cut. I've also brought in Josh Kennedy, the retired striker who just finished his last season in football with Melbourne City. He's recently retired, so we're going to give him a job as a coach. See, his man management's good. Working with youngsters is good. So he's going to... 
he's actually already started working on his Continental B license, I think, or Continental A license. I'm not sure which it was. So these will get a boost throughout the course of the season as well. And he joins a pretty good coaching group, which was already at the club. I've just offered him all new deals. Training has gone pretty well thus far. Everyone's just been working on their individual roles throughout the course of the preseason. They were on heavy, but now we're a bit of four. So about a week before this first game against Sydney, I set everyone to light. Let's have a look at our transfers. We've had a few come in and a ton leave. So we brought in Vitisic, Edwards, Lowry, Moy, and Hurd. Dario Vitisic, we spoke about earlier. We're actually training him to be a left winger, and he's been pretty good there so far during preseason. He has all the attributes and everything to do that role. So if we go here, winger and attack. See here, he's double figures in all of them already, so he should be more than happy in that position. Left footed player though, uh, sorry, right footed player playing on the left hand side. He is probably going to cut in more often than not, but at least Zulo can then bomb on into that space. And to be honest with you, moving into the final third in our preseason, we've looked really, really good. So we're getting five forward consistently. The wingers are sort of hanging around the edge of the box here. Um, the two fullbacks are bombing into these areas, and the striker seems to stay very central, which is great for us. Uh, Ryan Edwards will take up the position on the right hand side. He's been pretty good so far. Only 20 years old, so he's on bugger all money. Uh, only a K a week on a long-term deal as well. Good pace, great stamina, incredible natural fitness. Technique will come with time and exposure to the first-team squad, and he's actually trained really well and already improved a little bit, so happy with him. Shane Lowry will partner Connor Chapman at the center of defense. I love it. We've got a left-footed center back and a right-footed center back. It just gives you a good balance, and he is going to be a phenomenal player. Got him for way less than I thought. I thought he'd want maximum money. However, 3 K a week on a long-term deal is pretty phenomenal. He does have a $1 million release clause, but honestly, if anyone's willing to pay a million bucks for him, I'll absolutely let him go. Aaron Moy has returned to the club. I did release him on a free uh, and then brought him back immediately. He was on 5.75K a week. You can see he brought him back for a K. So he's on bugger all money. He's on, I think, a thousand. So he doubles his money when he plays, and I think he gets another 200 if he just sits on the bench, but he will likely play the majority of the games. That way we can sneakily pay him 2k a week when he plays, but only have a k on our wage budget. So really good technical ability. He's going to be awesome for us, and I've actually set him to take all of our free kicks and corners and stuff as well. He's only 13, but I think they'll improve during the course of the season. Chris Hurd will play alongside him in the other advanced playmaker role. Ex-Aston Villa Academy Junior, he's going to be an absolute beast for us. He's on max contract, which is 4k a week, which is the most we can offer to a first-team player. Also on 1.6 million a week, but I think his release cause is about 2 million, so more than happy to have him. You can see here, mental's through the roof, physical's through the roof, his technique needs a little bit of work, but more than good enough to play in this league at that level. And given that we're playing like a high-pressing game in midfield as well, uh, with those two advanced playmakers and the anchorman set to close down more, I think he's going to be awesome in that role. Eli Babal. Now, this is one that kind of came out of nowhere. I was just having a look around at players that were maybe transfer listed by their club or whatever it was, and he was. So we managed to pick him up for only 100k a week. However, he wants big wages, so he's going to be an Australian marquee player. Actually, an ex-Melbourne City player, started his career with Melbourne Heart, came through that first team, made scored two goals in the very first season Melbourne Heart ever played uh, off from 13 appearances. The year after that, he was given like a starting berth, playing up front as that target man. And despite only being, I think, 18 or 19 at the time, scored nine goals in 22 appearances, which is pretty good for a teenager. Got a decent move to Red Skidar Belgrade over in Serbia, but they ran into a bit of financial trouble themselves. And when it came to his $300,000 fee, he they just never pay, paid it. So the time came for them to sign the check or send the funds to Melbourne Heart, even though Babal had already had over. And they just never paid it. So he ended up coming back to Melbourne Heart uh, during the course of the 2012-2013 season. And he was absolutely fucking miserable during that time. Made nine, nine appearances, most of them in, in midfield because he wanted to play in midfield. Only scored one goal, didn't really try all that hard. He was just being a prissy little bitch when he came back. So it was really frustrating. Somehow, AZ Alkmaar decided to give him a chance. He went over there and spent a couple of years in their youth team. I think he's now gone to a different club somewhere in Europe. Oh no, he's back in the A-League. He's actually back in the A-League playing for Adelaide United in the game. We're going to sign him up and have him play for Melbourne City. You can see here, great jumping reach, pretty solid pace for a big tall kid. Uh, good acceleration as well. We are working on that advanced forward role and he's done really well in training thus far. Though he did pick up an injury. I think he did, like he got a sport turn here or something like that. So he's missed most of the preseason. Heading's good, dribbling and finishing are both pretty good. He's going to be that target in the middle of the box there at 193 centimeters is a good target to have. And he's on a okay contract and a pretty low release fee as well. So if any European sides come in for him, he'll absolutely go. But there we go. We're going to play with an Australian marquee. 
David Williams, not interested in coming back. Uh, if we go approach to sign, he just wants stupid, stupid money, like to play. He basically wants like 20 grand a week when he's not worth two grand a week. So he can fuck right off. We released a ton of guys that were in the youth side. Uh, they were just there on like non-contracts. I think they were having trials. We've gotten rid of the majority of them, as well as the international players. So Fawn Rolly left, Sorensen, Corrin, Hughes, Navio, they all left as well, and a couple of others that were in the youth side. Kuzminovsky was on a full-time contract. He's just not quite as developed as he should be. He's pretty good in real life for a 17, 18-year-old winger, but in the game, it's just not reflected yet. So Espindola got the nod ahead of him for that full-time contract. And Philip Petreski, one of our youth team players, decided to declare himself a Macedonia. So given it's an Australian dynasty challenge, we kind of had to let him go as well. But that's fine. He was never going to get a run out in the team anyway. Both Jack Clisby and Michael Zullo are much, much further ahead in their development than him. So those are the six that were brought in. They have been pretty fantastic so far throughout the course of the preseason. We're actually yet to taste defeat or even draw in any of our games and have only conceded two goals in all those matches, which was in our very first friendly. We didn't have a whole lot of players fit and available. Uh, most of these guys were here on trial contracts at that particular point. Still a comfortable 4-2 win in that game, and we have not conceded a goal since. Our two competitive fixtures, first one against Stanmore Hawks in the FFA Cup, we won 6-0. Pretty fantastic result there. A debut hat-trick for Corey Gamero. Kiss Norberg, Garuccio, Marino were the other scorers in that game. A first goal for the first team for Marino as well. The other competitive fixture was our FFA Cup second round game. A bit more of a test this time, though we did have a lot of our signings here at the club. Gamero again with a double. He's been fantastic so far scoring in preseason. We'll likely get the nod in the first game of the year. And Connor Chapman with the other one, his first goal for the club. Could have been way more than three. However, we just didn't finish the chances that we had, which is fine. It's preseason. Like these things happen. To not concede a goal in the rest of the games and to win all of our rest of the games, pretty thrilled with that. Though it's not really any indication. It's a massive step up, step up playing Sydney FC first game of the season. They'll be a really good side and I'd expect them to be around the top six positions if not challenging for the title. I have set a new captain for the season. It's going to be Eric Pardaloo. He's taking the armband from Patrick Kisnorbo. Purely because Kisnorbo is likely going to be more of a backup and not playing the majority of games. So he will be the backup and Eric Pardaloo will take the armband from the off. Given that when he's fit and available, he'll likely play in that anchorman role. If we go to our inbox here and search for numbers, I've announced the squad numbers for the season. Uh, I've just basically followed what everyone's are in real life. A couple of exceptions. Valafi usually wears 20. Standard in the A-League is that the main choice goalkeeper wears number one and the backup wears number 20. That's pretty common for all of the sides that we'll come up against. Even Franich will take number two. Uh, basically, any site player that we've signed will take over the number from the player that they have replaced. So, for example, Shane Lowry is going to take the number three, which would have been Aaron Hughes' number. Eli Babar will take the number nine, which was Harry Navio's number, but I like the number nine to go to the striker. Chris Heard will take Robbie Corrin's number 10. Dario Vitasic will take number seven, which I think has actually been taken by uh, Corey Gamero, but he's going to take 15 instead. And I think that's just about it. Edwards, the other new signing, will take 23, which wasn't a side to anyone. Previously worn by Gigandic, who's an old winger. So squad numbers are pretty much accurate with what they actually wear in the real world, with the exceptions of Gamero, Valafi, and the new signings in the game. Having a look at the media and their predictions for the side, they think we're going to have a relatively good season, but it'll pretend how we go. This was back when Robbie Corrin was still at the club, so they've spoken about him as one to watch and Chris Hurd as well. Now that Robbie Corrin is gone, um, it's probably likely that you know someone else has jumped into that role, maybe Pardaloo or someone like that. We can see here, impressively, the entire Melbourne City FC team is homegrown and doesn't feature a single non-Australian player. I think that's a bit of a glitch. It's because Robbie Corrin was sitting in the reserves, so apparently his reputation was big enough for him to be in this article, but he was in the first team, so we didn't have a non-Australian player. We now only have Australians in both the youth team and the first team, so that is fine and falls in line with what we're trying to do with our Australian Dynasty Series, improving Australian football and players. And let's have a look at our odds for the season. You can see here, Melbourne Victory, uh, Price is four to six favourites to win the league. Wanderers just behind them. And we are third with a four to five squad. Sydney at evens. Don't worry about this too much, if I'm being brutally honest. It goes entirely on club reputation. So if we were going to go and search for like Australian clubs and they're standing in the world, it means victory would be top, Wanderers would be second, and we'd be third. That's all that means. 
And that's basically the same for any league that you do. I don't know how people ignore it. It doesn't take into account the strength of your squad, though Victory and Wanderers do have good squads. It doesn't take that into account. It doesn't take into account you being the favourite. It's all about your standing within the club. Uh, sorry, within the world and your club reputation. So that's how that is picked, though I would expect probably Victory, Sydney and Brisbane will challenge mainly for the title. Wanderers might be involved in that, depending on how the game rates their squad at present. Um, and I'd expect us to be comfortably either challenging for the title or comfortably within this top six. I think we've put together a really good squad. We've got tremendous depth. We have one extra player, which is Eli Babal. I picked him up purely because the opportunity presented itself for us to get a 22 player with international experience to jump in and play as that advanced forward. I'm not 100% sold on Corey Gamero, despite him getting five goals in our opening two competitive fixtures. The injury to Baval will mean he'll start as well. And Marino's purely there, really, as a development player. So 21 players. We do have room to sign two players further, as well as the ability to sign a marquee player, should one present itself. There are a couple of players, uh, Australians, that are internationally that we're just watching at the moment. We're just going to see exactly how they go at their clubs, if they go up for loan or anything like that. Tom Rogic is one that we maybe could look at, but really he's we're not playing anyone in the hole, and we've got Vitasic if we do change formation. So I'm just keeping an eye on him for the time being. Now, let's have a look at our season as it goes forward and our schedule. The structure will be very similar to our Bromley save. I might just do one... I might do the games as double headers, though. So we'll play two games per episode, and we'll just play a game every couple of weeks. So, for example, we might go out in the next episode and play our first game against Sydney FC, and then our FFA Cup quarterfinal against Heidelberg United. And then after that, we might come back for, you know, the Melbourne victory game. And if we make it through against Heidelberg, again, our FFA Cup semifinal or something like that. We'll have to wait and see exactly how it pans out throughout the course of the year. We actually have played our FFA Cup quarterfinal opponent in the preseason, Heidelberg. And in the real world, Melbourne City actually plays them on the 29th of September in their quarterfinals as well. So it's weird that the game has kind of mimicked real life in that sense. That'll be a cool game to go and watch uh, at Olympic Village, which is their home ground. They have actually previously played in the old National Soccer League, the old NSL, but we'll talk about that further in the build-up to the game. And we comfortably beat them 2-0 in that match with goals to Vitasic and Garuccio. Moy and Gamera picked up injuries in those games, which is a bit of a pain, but that's fine. These things happen. Anyway, I'm pretty happy with the squad that we've put together. I think it's going to be a successful season for us. I'm hoping that we can challenge for the title with the group of players that we have. We've put together a great group. Tremendous depth at all the positions and good competition for places there. We probably signed one extra player on what we've got. Oh, the other thing. The other thing I forgot to say. Our training facilities. So the first thing I did was go to the board and say we need to improve our training facilities. They agreed. So they are doing that now. They've spent $3 million on it, which is massive. So we started the season with 5.8. We're currently about 2.49. This bump down here is because of all the contracts and stuff that we terminated plus the signing on fees that we gave to players signing new contracts but the majority of our expenditure during that time has been towards our training facilities so that's going to cost three million dollars which is an insane amount i'm hoping it gives us five star training facilities which would be awesome so that's something that we'll have to keep an eye on throughout the course of the season but I think we are in more than good enough stead to go on and have a really successful year. And I'm hoping it's going to be a fun save. I think there's definitely an interesting one to be had somewhere in the A-League. Whether it's this one or not remains to be seen. But hopefully I can both share knowledge from the A-League in the real world and give it a little bit more exposure across the channel. Future episodes won't be this long though. I do promise that this is just one where we've covered a tremendous amount of stuff. We've gone through the history of Melbourne City as a club, got through the entirety of the squad in great depth. We went through all of our transfer targets, went through our tactic, and we went through the entirety of preseason. So those things are always now there up in a video for you to go back and check out if you want to. We can use this video as a reference point for the rest of the series, but going forward, it'll just be double-headed games in each episode. As always though, Thank you very much for watching. I do appreciate it. I'm not going to beg you for likes or subscriptions, though if you have any feedback, chuck it in the comment section below. If you have any saves you want to see me do in Football Manager 2015 or in Football Manager 2016 once it's released, put those in the comment section. And of course, any links to your own YouTube content, I will absolutely go and check it out and send a like your way. But thank you very much for watching, and I look forward to seeing you again in the next episode, which should be Season 1, Episode 2.